welcome to Homeschooling Outside the Box, the podcast that encourages and equips moms to homeschool an outside-the-box child. Hey there, I'm Cindy Renna. Thanks so much for joining me today. We are going to continue on with our series about homeschool rhythms. We are working our way through the day. We have covered morning time. We've talked about narration. We've talked about getting ready and group work. And the last episode, we talked about individual work. If you missed any of those, I'll link to the individual work in the show notes, and then you can track down the rest of the series from there. And so today we're going to talk about read alouds. So read aloud for us happens during lunch and also in the evening. So that's why we're on read alouds because that's the part of the day that we're on. We're on lunchtime. So reading aloud is really, it's a crucial, crucial part of your homeschool. Now you can read aloud even if you don't homeschool and it would be a crucial part of your day then too. But why in all of our busy day do we need to really make sure that we have time for reading aloud? Okay, and just to clarify, you might be thinking, well, yeah, I read aloud um, our history, or I read aloud our science, uh, or we read aloud poems, and those are fantastic, and we do that too, and that's good, but I am specifically on this episode talking about reading aloud literature, and specifically I'm talking about picture books and novels. So let's start with what might be an obvious question. Why should we read aloud? My number one answer to this question is because of relationship. So when you read aloud a story together, you and your children have a shared experience. So these people become, or these characters become a part of your family culture. You know, you get to know them. You've you've been to the Hundred Acre Woods together. You've traveled with Frodo, you know, to... On his journey, you're all heartbroken when Beth dies in Little Women. You all rejoice together when Scrooge turns into a good guy and changes his life around at the end of A Christmas Carol. You all stand in awe at Aslan and cheer for the kings and queens of Narnia. You all wish to travel to Neverland together or Wonderland, and you all wonder, maybe, mom in particular, if Mary Poppins will show up one day. So relationships and that shared experience is my number one reason for reading aloud together. But there's more. The other great benefit is vocabulary. So your children are going to be able to encounter a vocabulary that they might not be able to at their own reading level. So I encourage parents to read up above a child's level and that is great for a few reasons. One, they get to hear good, fluent reading, okay? So you are modeling what that reading might sound like for them. You get to introduce them to those vocabulary words that, especially when the children are younger, you know, are not gonna be in those early readers. A lot of those words they can't handle yet, and so they're not available. The other thing with vocabulary is um, a lot of the books we like to read are some of the older classics And the vocabulary is much richer in some of those books than in the average book that your child might pick up at the library. So you're exposing them to great vocabulary. You're also exposing them to really great ideas. So again, with this idea of reading up, you know, or um, reading a story that really can benefit the whole family, no matter what age the children are, those are going to be your really solid stories that have great ideas in them. Another benefit to reading up is that if you are reading them a story that maybe, you know, there's a part that they might be a little sensitive about or if there's some language in there that you want to skip over, you can quickly edit as you read aloud. Another thing to keep in mind is you're helping struggling readers access ideas. So whereas I'm saying to read up above your child's reading level, that's good. But what if you have a child who's in fourth grade who is only reading at a second grade reading level right now because he's dyslexic? Okay, so now you have this fourth grader who desires more mature ideas 
and storylines, but he can't access them on his own. So you are the bridge for your child. Audiobooks are another wonderful option for this, you know, where you can, he can kind of set off on his own. But if you're reading aloud, you know, keep that in mind. You're also able to help him access those stories that he can't on his own yet. And the final reason to read aloud is it helps your child identify as a reader. When you read aloud together, you're sending a message that this family reads. This is a thing that we do that is totally normal. And especially if you're reading aloud, we read together. This is something we do as a family. And so that helps them to really identify with themselves as a reader, but also, you know, this is the kind of family I come from. Those are my reasons for why you should read aloud. If you are not convinced, uh, I'm going to leave some links in the show notes of some really interesting articles I've read. Um, I'm also a huge fan of the Read Aloud Revival. She's got a lot of great stuff on that podcast. So if you're not familiar with that, you can check that out. And then there are some books that I will recommend as well that really helped to um, solidify my my beliefs about reading aloud. So, okay, so that's number one, why you should read aloud. Um, the next thing I want to address is to whom, okay? Who should be in this audience as you're reading aloud? A lot of times in our culture, you know, we think, okay, you just read aloud to the child until they learn how to read, and then you send them off with their easy readers, and eventually they'll become a reader. The problem with that is that, like I touched on earlier with the vocabulary, a lot of the things that they're reading are not things that are really great. I mean, they're they're needing to read some easy words, repeat it over and over. Um, you know, if you think of The Cat in the Hat, it's a it's a cute book. It's a great start. If you sit it next to Charlotte's Web or A Wrinkle in Time or Little Women or The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, I don't know that it's going to hold hold up. There's you can see there's a big difference in those. So if my daughter is able to read The Cat in the Hat, and that's fantastic, and so she's reading that and getting better and stronger as a reader, but at the same time at bedtime I'm reading aloud the Secret Garden, or Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, or The Wizard of Oz. Well, then you can see she's getting this really high quality language coming into her ear. And so not only is that good just in and of itself, but it's also helping her to move faster as a reader because as she hears these words, then she can more easily identify them when she comes across them herself. So that's kind of a no-brainer, though, that we read to the little kids. I don't think you would get a lot of argument from parents about reading to young ones. That's been proven over and over for decades. This is a really good thing to read aloud to your kids, to your little ones. I think where parents start to, you know, veer off a little bit is as the child's in second, third, fourth grade, as they get older, then we think, oh, they're a big kid. They don't need to be read aloud to. But you don't age out of any of the things that I listed in my reasons for why. Okay? it's ne- They're never too old to have that relationship component, that shared experience. They're never too old to be read up to. I mean, there are books that I pick up that I think, geez, these are really difficult words, you know, difficult ideas to grapple with. There's always a level up from where you are. So certainly when your children are in elementary and middle and high school, I mean, there's definitely a big gap between the hardest book of all time and where they're at. So it's still beneficial for you to read up to them. It's still beneficial for them to get that new vocabulary. And you can still help your struggling readers access ideas that are more mature than what their reading level is at. None of those stop applying. So the answer to this you know, who are you reading to is everyone. And we took this so far last Christmas that we read as a whole family, uh, a Christmas carol. We read it all together, even my husband. It was um, as picturesque as it could be with, you know, some nights of grumpy attitudes and uh, interruptions and all the things that happen in a normal family. But 
we we turned the fire on we had hot cocoa and we all sat in the same room and took turns reading a christmas carol and so we've got this wonderful memory and hopefully tradition that everybody will remember because everybody took part in so there's nobody that you can't read aloud to um and if you think back to early america you know and this is why a lot of the classics are written it you can't put a grade level on them like they do nowadays or you don't flip it over and it says grades three through eight or ages eight to 12 or whatever. They didn't do that with, you know, little women or great expectations or some of these older books. And the reason was because the way those were read back then was sitting around the fire. Everybody from, you know, they didn't have TV. They didn't have iPhones. They didn't. So they would the whole family from the baby crawling on the floor to grandma sitting in the rocker. And so it had to be literature that was worth hearing no matter how old you were. So C.S. Lewis has this great quote, a children's story that can only be enjoyed by children is not a good children's story in the slightest. These stories should be enjoyed by a broad audience. If it's a good story, everyone should enjoy it. Never stop reading aloud. Okay, and finally, we're going to talk about how. My first step is to choose from a great list. I have a link that I can leave that that will give you a free list that I have put together through the 10 plus years of reading aloud to my kids. And so you can check that out. It's got some ideas for different age groups. It's got some ideas for seasonal read alouds. So you're welcome to enjoy that and choose from those books. There's many other lists floating around out there, entire books written with lists in the back. So um, if, if you do a quick Google search, I'm sure you will find some good books. I will say this, look for books that show up on all the lists, okay? And that does not mean your kid's going to love that book. You guys could pick up a book that's on every list and you could hate it. So if that happens... You know, try to give it a chance, figure out why people hate it. It might be just one part that you need to get through, just a bump. Um, my son can be really sensitive about some things. And years ago, we started The Secret Garden in the first couple pages, just because of the parent's death and her being an orphan. I mean, he was like, shut the book. I don't like it. I don't want to read the rest. I don't want to know. And so we sort of dealt with that. And I knew that was not going to be what the whole story was about. I knew there was so much more that he would really enjoy if we could just get over that bump. And so we talked through it. He gave it a chance, ended up loving the story. So if it's something like that, try to work with it. If it is just, I mean, the whole time you're reading, you're thinking, I do not know why this is on all these lists. I don't like this. I don't understand it. And you're just reading for pleasure. You know, it's just, and everybody just groans and you're not having a shared experience and, you know, none of the re- the whys are coming into play, then, you know, you choose a different book. Who cares if it's on every list? But definitely that is, that is a good way to go about it is to look for titles that show up over and over. They've lasted through time. They've passed the test of time. Generation after generation loves them. You know, if, if I recommend Winnie the Pooh to somebody, the real poo, not like a Disney version. Winnie the Pooh by A. A. Milne. I'm I'm 99% sure they're gonna love it. You know, so that is something that we've read multiple times and it's been around forever and people have loved it forever. So look for look for books that you see showing up over and over again. Um, ask your friends. Call friends who have kids maybe a couple of years older than yours and just tell them, say, give me your top five books. You know, what What five titles are, you know, you just think are excellent choices for books? And again, you're looking for literature. So we're not talking about some of the books that the kids might just grab off the shelf at the library, but books that really have a lot of quality to them. That's what Charlotte Mason calls a living book. Okay, so choose from a great list is your first step. And then shoot for twice a day. So this does not have to be long. It can be five or 10 minutes. And here's, here's how we have worked this in. This has changed 
with my kids' ages. This changes with the season. So there's nothing set in stone. You work it into your schedule where you can. But what has always worked for us is to read aloud at lunchtime. And we specifically read picture books at lunchtime. They're a quick win. You get the whole story in one sitting. As the kids have gotten older, we read longer picture books. Uh, Picture books really are written for, there's many out there that are written for older audiences, all ages. Um, So we usually will read from a picture book and specifically we will try to read a seasonal something. So like right now, it's October, we're reading things like um, Too Many Pumpkins, we're reading The Bremen Town Musicians, Um, we've read The Oxcart Man, and we are going to read, so this is not a picture book, but we're going to read a few poems by Edgar Allan Poe, so just to to be a little Halloween-y next week, but we read The Legend of Sleepy Hollow together. That is by Washington Irving. It's a short story, but it's in picture book form. So we just took a few days. I think it took us a week or two to read a little bit every day. So that all, you know, cater that to your kid's age, to whatever season it is. And then if it's not, if you're not near a particular season or you've kind of, you know, summertime is an example where you kind of read the three or five or six summary books, then you just read whatever. There's a lot of great picture books out there to choose from. So don't get obsessive about, you know, fitting the right book to the right time. But if if you are wanting to read seasonal picture books, lunchtime usually ends up being a great time. Okay, and then we also try to keep an audiobook going in the car. So this was great, especially when the kids were younger. And nobody could stay home alone, so everybody had to go everywhere with me, no matter where I went. So we would always have an audiobook going in the car. So that's another way to get some reading in. Um, And then at different times and different seasons, we've read aloud a novel at bedtime. So this this can happen a few different ways. You can do it actually at bedtime, you know, like you go in there, everybody's getting ready for bed, and you read aloud a chapter. Or like we did at Christmas time, it was right before everybody had to go to bed. We gathered in the living room and we read aloud and then everyone went and brushed their teeth and went to bed. We have also done, um, cause we have three older boys and then a younger daughter. So my husband and I have traded off where, you know, he would do kind of prayers and devotionals with one and I would be reading a chapter from a novel with the other group. And then we would switch and he'd go do prayers and devotion with the one I just read aloud to and I would go read aloud. I mean, you could snuggle up on the couch in the middle of the afternoon if that works for you. And that I always wanted to do that. I always pictured us, you know, sometime in the afternoon, curled up on the couch with a stack of books, reading aloud. And I can't remember if we ever really did that, maybe with the boys. But, um, you know, when they were all little and all the same age, um, but that's that never really worked for our family, so that's okay. If there's if you've got something in your head where it's it's got to look a certain way, it doesn't. We often read when everybody's sitting around the table. So you know, if we can, I keep a, a basket of books next to the chair just in case somebody comes and sits next to me and we get a minute. But it's fine if it doesn't look like you have it in your head. The idea is just to read aloud and all. Those magical things that I mentioned in the beginning are going to happen. If you're connected and you're reading a book that you guys are both enjoying, you're going to get the benefits from reading aloud. So the last thing I will say is not to focus too much how much time you're spending reading aloud. For some of our kids with attention challenges, you might just get five or ten minutes. You might just get short picture books. Um, You might get really short picture books until you kind of get into the habit of doing it. And that's okay. Start wherever they're at. And then as it becomes a practice, as it becomes a habit, as they start to connect, oh, at lunchtime, we read aloud. Moms have asked me, when do you eat? Well, I just eat after or before. It doesn't, you know, it's it's like a 10-minute thing. So um, we all eat dinner together. We don't, you know... That's important too for everybody to eat at the same time. But for lunchtime, I think it's more, it's a 
better opportunity for me to read aloud. When my kids were really little, that's when it started because they were all sitting and they were filling their mouths. And so those two things made the perfect (laughs) atmosphere for me to read something. And then it kept them engaged. And so once it becomes a habit, then, you know, you can start stretching that time a little bit and trying to select a little bit longer books. I just wouldn't worry too much about you know, oh, we only read for five minutes each time. That's okay. You know, just keep trying. I hope that I've given you some ideas and encouragement to make reading aloud a priority in your homeschool. And I hope that you have a great week. Thank you so much for listening and I'll talk with you soon. Thanks so much for listening to Homeschooling Outside the Box. If you are loving the show, please head over to iTunes and leave a review. This is a great way to help other moms just like you find encouragement in their homeschool with their outside-the-box child as well. For more encouragement, be sure to head to cindyrenna.com and you can check out some great blog posts as well as a shop that will help equip you on your homeschooling journey.